If I could get your attention once more, please. We are now going to talk about um, SEO. Uh, the title is Denial is Not a River in Egypt, The New Age of SEO. And I was speaking to Nick about this before. And we have no idea what that means, but it sounds really cool and trendy and fun. So uh, hopefully this panel will be really cool and trendy and fun. Now, everyone up on this panel would like to get questions from the audience at any time. So if you have a question at any time, raise your hand. Does anyone have a question now? You know it's never too early to start. I'm also going to ask this audience, I'm uh, sorry, this panel, if they will ask each other questions and challenge each other. So if someone says something that is incomplete, foolish, stupid, or just plain wrong, please bring them up on it and ask them why they said something foolish, stupid, incomplete, or wrong. Because we can't have that anymore. We don't like that stuff. Um, ladies and gentlemen, on the stage, we have Mr. Nick Garner. He's an entrepreneur and the, uh, the CEO and, and founder of Oshi and PRable.com. To his left, we have Mr. Gavin Moore, who is head of traffic and brand. And to his left, we have Mr. Philly Wise, who is a consulted SEO expert and who just informed me will lead the most popular workshop tomorrow at SEO Brighton, or Brighton SEO, sorry, um, where I will be joining him on Friday. So, ladies and gentlemen, our, for our esteemed panel, we want to talk first about links, then we're going to talk a little bit about on-site, then we're going to talk a little bit about everything else. Um, gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Let's start then links. Um, listen, how far can links get me in 2018? Uh, can I still get to a number one spot just through links? We've had sessions that have argued it both ways, and we've had very convincing arguments that you can get to a number one spot without any links. So in a very competitive industry, can links get me anywhere in 2018? Why don't we start with Gavin? Sure. Um, I think it really depends on the type of website and the type of content that you have and the type of search query that you're also trying to um, solve, basically. Um, if it's low volume and it's not that competitive, I think links can go a very long way. But if it's just the standard links that anyone can basically build, uh, if you've got enough money and you've got the right contacts, then I don't think you're going to differentiate yourself. But I think if you're looking at a much more competitive search term, you're definitely not going to get to number one just by links. Um, this is where user engagement, uh, actually having the best content and answering the query best is going to come into play. Nick. Uh, yeah. So I just want to say something totally on SEO here. So we were just chatting beforehand, and Philly said he was going to do his best to be controversial, and he did ask that we wouldn't take it personally. So I'm looking forward to some punchy stuff from you, Philly. And uh, anyway, back to the link stuff. I, to me, it's super simple. Links help you get there. And then once the traffic uh, or the, the uh, engagement data comes through, then your rankings decouple from links. So there's this whole issue with affiliates being obsessed about links still, and I, uh, hopefully we can deal with that. Uh, but essentially, yeah, l l to me, in a sense, links are dead. But long live links. So you say they're going to get you to a place. How far is a link going to, is a link going to get you to a place where Google can then analyze the rest of the analytics? Yeah, so or my, is, my is newness going to do that? Yeah, so my hypothesis, and I think it's, it's one that's getting a lot more traction with a lot more people that know what they're talking about, is that uh, once you get into the top 10 and there's sufficient traffic coming through, then Google looks at things like click-through rates from their search results and dwell time, i.e. the pogo stick effect, i.e. The, the, uh, that situation where you bounce into a site, you go, ah, oh, that's not what I want, and then you come back out and you click another search result and you hang around in that page, Google can see there's stuff going on there. And then my hypothesis, again, is that there is a, 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 they're looking for a mismatch, in effect, between the engagement they expect per search result and what actually happens. If there's more of the good stuff, then result go, site goes up, less it goes down. And if what I always point out to people is that search results uh, are constantly in flux. So if you're a statistician, you want to see variance because it helps you come up with a solid number that says this is what we expect here. Now, saying all of that, 
Philly here used to work in Google, so he knows his potatoes better than I do on these things. But that's the way I'm seeing it, and uh, I've seen this happen really over the last four years. So another way to ask before we go on to Philly, another way to, to uh, frame your, your concept, your hypothesis, w would it be correct for me to say you're assuming that the higher you rank, the less links matter and the more other Absolutely. indicators do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've okay. seen this with uh, a friend of mine who's got a, a bingo site, and he is almost anti-links, and he had done really well on bingo key phrases, no links. And I had looked at his link profile, there were no links, really. There was some spam uh, autogen stuff that obviously was some sort of negative link attack or whatever, which is a bullshit construct or bullshit thing anyway. But uh, the fact is, he ranked without links. Then he started messing around with his website, messed up some of the UX, r rankings dropped, we did a bunch of work on his UX, not a, and it wasn't big stuff, it was just simple basic things that he got wrong. He fixed those, rankings went back up. How about that? And I see this consistently. Uh, there's a big brand called Matchbook. When I was dealing with them years ago, they had an agile, they were, they were using uh, Angular, and the only thing the en engines were indexing was their uh, title tag. Yet they ranked all the way across uh, uh, sports exchange phrases, uh, despite this complete lack of on-site SEO, because it's an exchange, the only real competitor to Betfair. So, you know, there's a real miscorrelation between links and rankings, and you just got to look at the data and see. So, Philly, as an ex-Googler, firstly, did you ever take a nap in the office? No. No? <laughs> no. I thought you were supposed to do crazy shit like that. Did they have a monkey there or anything fun? I had massages. Yeah, massages in the office. Yeah, yeah, the good massage table, um, um, yeah, all that kind of stuff. And good lunches, of course. But, uh, and then back to the question. Yeah, no, a lot of fun stuff. Um, actually, I'm going to ask a question to the audience first before I give the answer. Um, how many of you, uh, please, by a show of hands, think that Google is against links? Anyone? Or against link building? Who thinks that Google is against link building? Show of hands. Wow. You all think Google is in favor of link building. You would be actually right. Google is not against link building. A lot of people think that Google is against link building, and that's absolutely not the case. But there is a but in that sentence there. Um, Google is against link building for the manipulation of page rank. It's the last part that they have a problem with, not the first part. Google uses links, and Google loves links for one very simple reason, and this ties back to what uh, Nick in part was saying as well. They like to discover content. Yeah? Once they know the content is there, from that moment on, the links don't carry that much weight anymore. It's really about the user experience at that point. Yeah? Managing the user expectations, stuff like that. It's really about being better than the competition. It's really about giving a unique sales proposition with every single page that you have, a unique experience, stuff like that, being a brand, all these, these things, they help, but it's really about the user at that point and user signals that are being generated within Google search results. Now, links do give an entry point to that because that allows Google to discover the content. It's about discovery. That's why Google loves links. Can you rank, however, uh, one of the early, uh, beginning questions, can you rank with just links? It is possible, absolutely. There are edge cases, mostly. And I can tell you also, and Google really doesn't like me saying this, um, some of these situations, we're talking about massive, massive, massive amount of hacked links. So links on other authority websites, those websites have been hacked, say a WordPress install or something like that, on, say, 10,000 domains, and they're all pointing to one. Yes, that can actually impact the ranking and potentially, not guaranteed, lift that particular one site up for a short period to the number one position or close to. There's no guarantee how long this will last. There's no guarantee uh, how quickly Google discounts that or uh, that you know, some of these hacks get discovered and the link just disappears again. Um, or the user signals tell Google, okay, this is not the page people are looking for. So 
there's a whole lot of variables there. Uh, Nick, says, uh, Nick says that uh, the search results are in flux. It's not just the search results. The entire web is in flux. Every day, about 20% gets edited, added, and removed. Yeah, that's a lot of documents. We're talking trillions at this point. So that's a lot of documents that we're adding, removing, and editing on a daily basis. Yeah? So this is something to keep in mind. Of course, the Google search results are just a snapshot of the last possible moment that Google has finished indexing part of what it has crawled. Yeah? That, there is also time delay. Sometimes it's minutes. Other times it's hours, based on prioritization of which URL uh, has been fully processed for them to be counted within the, uh, within the search results for a query. Yeah? Then on top of that, user signals come on top of that uh, to say like, okay, should this rank or not? Uh, let's ask the users. A lot of, you t a lot of time you'll see experiments uh, within Google search results, things popping up saying like new designs or a label saying this page is not mobile friendly or you know all of these type of things or like the AMP sim uh, symbol at the moment. These are basically all experiments trying to see what users like. Do they help users better understand what they're getting? Managing their expectations. You know, it's all basically one big uh, multivariation test for Google. Yeah, yeah. and uh, there's another, so, so I think there's a couple of things here. A, links have value, they can work. And then the leading question is, what's a good link? Mm -hmm. uh, and is there such a thing as a bad link? So I wrote an article in IGB a while ago about bad links. and. Gary Isles, who I'm sure you know, was at Brighton SEO talking about this, and he says there is no such thing as a bad link. And he's a Google employee and kind of the, the main figurehead for the SEO community these days, isn't he? Or one of them, I know. One of them. Yeah, I know there's the guy in Switzerland as well. Yeah, Joe Muller. Yeah. Um, but it, th there's this thread about, but we just heard about this, uh, this idea that you could get a hacked you could, you could connect in with a network of hacked websites like SAPE, for example, the Russian network, uh, S-A-P-E, if you're interested. And uh, you could go and just buy a stack of links and yeah, you would probably rank. There's this thing that, like, again, I'm defaulting to you, Philly, on this, but as I understand it, Gary Isles spoke about this at Brighton SEO and he had said that uh, he doesn't even do disavow on his own website. He doesn't believe in disavow. He wasn't being explicit, explicit, but essentially this idea that you should care about every single potentially toxic link is just bullshit. And it makes sense that it would be because once you start to add a negative value to a link, you're in warfare territory because all you're gonna end up doing is having the equivalent of DDoS attacks on websites where people try and nuke a competitor's website with a bunch of shit links. So, so there's this whole thing about, oh, I'm afraid of this, you know, a link from this site. I Really? The only thing I would be worried about is manual penalties. Because if you go around doing what some people have done, i.e. you go and buy advert, ad space or something and you have sponsored link and it's a follow link, that's kind of stupid. But if you co cover your tracks and you get links from sites that have value from a link perspective, that's okay. I'm waiting to hear from you, Philly. I would just like, to, well, ask, I would just like yeah. to ask something about the disavowal, because why would Google have disavowal? Because clearly they're trying to collect some data as to what poor websites look like, right? And then they can kind of segment these poor websites and um, guesstimate more poor websites because they do look alike, so I'm guessing. Again, looking at you, Philly. Yeah. Um, and then this is how they determine what a poor link looks like, and, and then that will obviously give you a negative, negative effect for why it's the disavowal. Um, you know, the disavow file will be completely useless. Well, the disavow, as I, as are, I understand are you suggesting it. maybe the disavow file is used to identify sites where that, that link to a lot of people when they shouldn't, and therefore your disavowing th sites are well, more of a tool to find out what sites that are linking to you that are rubbish? Well, I think, well, I think disavow, as I understand it, disavow was principally a machine, was training machine learning algorithms. So what you do is you run a big socially, social manipulation program and you frighten lots of people who should know better and you tell them toxic links, you've got to get rid of them, etc. What does that do? 
it gives Google a massive flood of very useful data, which then helps them train their algorithms to identify sites that should not pass link juice. It's a bit like when they did, uh, when they were training their algorithms to do speech recognition, they did a free directory service, a directory inquiry service for a couple of years to aggregate a bunch of data. So, yeah, sorry, you've all been duped, I'm afraid. Now, of course, this is dangerous opinion. And well, surely it's not now, everyone it's in the room could, it, could, it, will yeah, necessarily agree with this opinion. It's validated by Google now, because this is Gary Isles on quote saying this stuff. So he wasn't absolutely explicit about it, but if you just research, if you, do, if you look up Gary Isles, I-L-L-Y-E-S, Brighton SEO 2017, you'll see the transcript from his panel where he talks about all this. Like I say, he doesn't even do to survive himself. He doesn't care. I mean, this is the kind of talk that got Galileo in trouble. This whole Earth is round nonsense is, we don't want to have it. <laughs> Philly, what do you think? So I differ a little bit of opinion here from Gary. And um, although I do know Gary, and he's a great guy, um, he's actually not in search. <laughs> so uh, a lot of people value a lot of the things that he says. If you also look at the history of what he has said in the past and how often Google had to jump in and correct him publicly, I would also say take everything with a little bit of a grain of salt what he says. So are you saying there are toxic links? No, what I'm saying is it can absolutely, links can absolutely harm you, but uh, in nowadays world, especially in the, pro, in the Penguin 4 world, that's not your major concern. It is, though, something you do want to manage from a manual backlink perspective. If you have any doubt, that is what the disavow tool is for. You can't put a nofollow on the site itself that's linking to you because you have no access to their code. But you can use the disavow tool and basically distance yourself. Now, to... That, that by intimation, you're saying there are toxic links. Because if you bother disavowing something, you're doing but it for like, a reason. So here's the thing. You just said, uh, and this is uh, what you just said a moment ago, was you're worried about manual penalties when it comes to linking. Right, so that's another story. Well, in a way, because that's how I see the disavow tool, a way to mitigate the risk of not being penalized by a manual penalty. Yeah? If you have done any link building in the past that may be considered a violation now or in the future, a violation of the Google Webmaster Guidelines, the disavow tool is the tool to manage and to prevent a manual penalty. If you have disavowed these links, they cannot count in your backlink profile as something that Google can penalize you for because you have disavowed them. So the threat is... Oh, I see it as a tool to manage your risk on manual penalties. Yeah, so let's say you've got your thin affiliate site and you want to rank somewhere and you happen to be able to get into a nice network, a safe network or something like that and get a half million decent hacked links. It's totally unethical, don't do it. But if you did, then even though there would be like link farm links and all sorts of junk, the fact is that, as I understand it, and what I've seen is that shit links are zero. And they're only negative in the sense of manual penalties, but from, from an algorithmic point of view, they're zero. So you can have infinity of junk links and have a few nice ones amongst it, and that's good. You're going to get your page rank and you're going to get your temporary rankings until your crappy website falls down the pile again because you've got no user engagement. There's a second element to it, and that doesn't make a link toxic or the risk of toxic, but more the risk of ratio. Uh, so if you, say, have 100 links to your website, just for the sake of argument, yeah, and 97 of them are low-quality links, now you have 3% of that being higher quality. You have 3% of quality links pointing to you of your entire backlink profile. Now, if you choose to disavow 50 of those low-quality backlinks, not because they're toxic, but because you don't want them to count in your graph. Yeah? Now, suddenly your 3% jumps up to 6% of quality backlinks on like a statistical level. So this is a second way how I see the disavow tool, a way to manipulate the quality of, or stimulate in a way, 
shouldn't say manipulate there, but more stimulate the quality and put your best foot forward towards Google. Basically saying, okay, you know what? We want to make sure that Google counts the links that we deem to be valid, to be good, and the ones that aren't, we don't want to be associated with, we don't want that to have any statistical uh, impact on how our potential link graph may be read by Google. Now, that is another way. That doesn't mean that those links are toxic. It just means it's a potentially missed opportunity. So just to be very clear in this, you're saying that you can water down link equity. I'm saying that you can basically say to Google, okay, this is what we would like to be associated with. It's still up to Google, even the disavow tool, uh, as well as the links themselves, it's up to Google to decide if they put any link uh, value into it, any equity in that, in that link, or if they adhere to the disavow to, uh, file that you submit. Just because you submit a disavow file doesn't mean that Google's going to use it. It's a suggestion to Google. So, no, you can't manipulate it, but you can suggest it. Right, so, so in order to kind of keep things simple, uh, you're saying that if I have a thousand links and they're, they're just an average, they're an average range of stuff, and we should also talk about what a good link is, by the way, I think that's important for everyone, but uh, you've got a thousand links, and then for some reason I pick up a million or 999,000 junk, zero links. Are you saying that that other million links essentially waters down my thousand? It depends, but it can. And you've seen that? I've seen, yes, it can. So the, here's the thing, it's all patering. So it's all, uh, well, a version of patering. It, like, to a certain level, it depends also on the distance and a number of other things. There's a, a number of factors that come into play. Uh, also, not all those links, even if you think they will, will actually pass PageRank. A, a bunch of them will not, uh, for various different reasons, distance being one of them, other ones being known patterns or algorithms kicking like Penguin or stuff like that, or even Panda kicking in for it. How do you think they got to Penguin? from Panda? You know, uh, they got to Panda, they came to uh, a Chrome extension. Yeah, so, it, 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 like, I know the guy who programmed the Chrome extension because he's a personal friend of mine. So uh, I was in the team at that point. So yeah, there's a lot of fun. And you're right to a certain level that it's about training. The disavow tool is to a certain level about training algorithms and stuff like that. Not as a social experiment. I don't think. Um, well, social en socially engineered enterprise. It wasn't. Yeah, I, uh, like, social experiment to is. To a certain level, you could different. argue that that's the entirety of Google because even the search result is. Of course. That applies to the search result because which search result we click affects the end result like down the line. So to that extent, yes, I don't think it was a bad intent or anything like that. It's more about, okay, this is how their way of thinking is. They outsource, they crowdsource, so to say, uh, to their users and they get data and then they try to improve the data and retrain the data. And yes, they get a lot of disavow files. If you just take all of the disavow files that you, that you received as Google, it take the top 1% of the domain names that have been submitted. You can probably say with a certain level of certainty, this is crap. Yeah, just 1%. And we're still talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of domains at that point. Just 1%. Yeah, you can already say straight away, okay, this is gonna be crap. We have a certain level in this. We can, we can be 99.9% .9 certain in this case that this is crap. Now, from uh, percent two to five, let's try to see where where is is you know where do the false positive become unacceptable? Stuff like that. This is all machine learning, all training of algorithms and stuff like that. And based on this, you can start improving other algorithms, including Penguin, etc. So yeah, links can have an impact. Uh, and I'm happy to answer, by the way, in a moment, I'll let you first uh, talk about uh, what is a good link. I have a good answer for that as well. well. I think it's important we share that. It is important to share that as well, yes. But I think you did it before with a show of hands. It'd be interesting to see from the affiliates in the audience here, like if you put your hands up, how many people use the disavow? Um, and how many people have seen positive effects after the disavow? Nope. I, I also would put my hand up on that one as well. So it's, I don't think personally it's, it's complete ball, so to speak, but um, yeah, it's an interesting tool, an interesting topic, but, uh, but yeah. 
Yeah. It, 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 a little bit like peeing <laughs> in the middle on this one. Yeah. Nick, oh, you're also messing up like three years of, of conference topics that we've done, telling people yeah, to disavow. Just, uh, I, <laughs> but I like it. I like the... I like the uh, well, okay. I like, I like if, evolving. If, if you all stuck your hand up, then statistically that would be significant. But I think there was three people or something. Yeah, but you also have to ask a first show of hands of who in the audience doesn't like to raise their hand, and you'd get a huge response. Well, I don't know. All I've had this all day. I got like three questions. When I, when I, I've done a fair bit of disavowing yeah. when I had an agency, and it was either nothing, either nothing happened or we accidentally killed the wrong links and rankings dropped a bit. So, yeah. Well, there, there's the question. So what's a good and a bad link? Well, how did you decide when you were disavowing what's a bad link? Um, how do you decide today what's a bad link? And then back to Philly's original question, um, what's a good link? Well, okay, so uh, Philly and I have debated about this in the past, and actually we sound different, but we're saying the same thing randomly. So just super simple, my thesis is that the only thing that Google totally trusts is its own data, and therefore it trusts websites it ranks kind of makes sense. It doesn't necessarily trust Majestic Trustflow or MozDA because it's not Google. So it trusts what it knows. And rankings are a very good indicator of the amount of trust it has in a website. So super simple. My thesis is if it ranks, that's probably a good place to get a link. That's it. There are, there are caveats to that, like internal page rank on the, on the site. So there are like homepage links, and there are links that are buried in the middle of nowhere and in the Huffington Post or something. But uh, on the whole, as a general rule of thumb, if it ranks, I'm interested. The more it ranks, the more interested I am. And the other thing I'm looking for is, so to do that, by the way, um, I either use SEMrush API, and I've got a tool which, which queries the API, and I can run big lists through it, or uh, I've found another tool called Digimeter, which is D-I-G-I-M-E-T-R dot com. And it, it's a pay-as-you-go thing, and it, it, it'll give you traffic numbers and proportion of traffic from search and so on. It's quite useful. So when I'm link prospecting, that's what I'm doing. I'm using Majestic to get the raw data. And from there, I'm running those lists through Digimeter or SEMrush API. And then if it doesn't rank, Goodbye. If it does rank, hello. And I then work from there. So, for example, when I've, you know, the Indian link seller stuff, I'm sure we've all got an infinity of emails from them. I actually bothered to look through the lists, run them through the data, and I was really surprised. About 10% of those sites actually ranked. Interesting and useful. So, that, that's me and links, super simple. So before we move on to on-page, do you have anything to add to that, uh, either Gavin or Philly? Yeah, um, I can add some, but you do. Yeah, no, I mean, I would say the same thing. In a nutshell, if a, traffic, a website that you're going to get a link from already has traffic from Google, then you know, that's probably a good sign initially. Um, and also with the link building that we do a lot in uh, Better Collective, and especially for our major websites like bettingexpert.com and so forth, we aim for media links because um, they're well trusted, they see a lot of traffic and um, this is also something not easy to copy um, if you're a competitor basically because it takes a lot of resource and effort and contacts. So yeah, something that's going to differentiate yourself from everybody else out there. I would take it one step further and basically say forget totally about page rank. It's not about the internal page rank, the external page rank, if it ranks or not. It's about the quality of the traffic that you're getting from it and if that converts on your website. So if you spend a lot of money on getting links and these links are not bringing direct traffic to your website that converts, it's a waste of money to me. It doesn't matter if the website ranks or not. It doesn't matter uh, from a brand perspective unless that is where your brand is, like your audience is. There's two types of links that you can build. Either brand visibility type of links, like think Coca-Cola. You can't buy a can of Coke on their website, but you know the brand and when you see it, you know, you, you recognize it, yeah? So it has a trust value from a brand ability, even though you can't buy anything of their product online, really. You know, not their primary product, at least. So um, the other type of link uh, is literally that to drive conversions. 
Those are the t two types of links that I would build. I don't care if the link is followed or not. I don't care if the, page, uh, the, the site ranks or not. I care, is there an audience there? Is there an audience that is likely to come to me and convert? Now, I'll give you one example. Um, I know of this company that, that bought a link. They, they bought this link on the home page, in the main menu of a newspaper. The link was not followed. They bought the link on the topics of loans. Then they were a loan provider. Yeah? This is a normal day-to-day -day newspaper, almost tabloid type of newspaper, but a massive big one. Had over 2 million uh, subscribers on their homepage, in their main menu, loans, you go to them. Yeah? Now, they get a lot, like this link, by the way, costed really, really a lot of money. We're talking uh, about 60 to 100,000 a year for a single link. But the amount of conversions mm. that you get to that, targeted conversions from their audience, that's what they were looking for. Yeah? I'm not saying this stuff is cheap. I'm saying you're looking for the links that actually drive business. One of the advantages by doing that, focusing on those type of links, is that your organic brand building will come over time because you're there where your audience can recognize you. The next time they see you in the search result, they're more likely to click you because you're already associated with another brand that they like. So that's one. So your organic link building comes over time. Short term, uh, this is long term by the way, this tends to be relatively long term. The short term part is you get business straight away. You can actually operate until that long term gets into effect. You actually get money straight into your pocket because of that traffic that converts. Right. So, so it's can also I reward you in that situation because you have a person on the site for a long time doing everything that you've just told your Google AdWords is a complete transaction. To a certain so level, uh, in a sense, you're going to get you're going to get a huge ranking because you have someone on your site for four minutes. Uh, no. Because Even if it's a no follow, you'll have a visitor. I, Google's going to see someone on your site. No, about, right? well, so so there's so what's happening now is lots of things are kind of getting mixed up here a little bit. Yeah. So, so don't don't confuse Google AdWords or AdSense or anything. No, I'm just saying that. Well, that think about your think site, about being a journey. You're going to get credit for that. Well, you think about so again, like I didn't work at Google, but whenever I think about SEO, I think as much like Google as I can, and I think about scale and efficiency. So, uh, in respect to Google, so what is the thing that they can, what information can they work at scale with? Well, it's the search results. It's the hopping in and out of search results. It's the tracking of sessions, etc. Once you start to get into trying to track different platforms and different systems like AdWords and this, that, and the other, it's probably going to get really messy unnecessarily and really complex, and therefore you kind of, it's just... Let, let, let me deep... Myth or debunk a myth there straight away. So, AdWords and all the other platforms, uh, they in principle they have zero impact on ranking for one very simple reason: uh, search is supposed to be unbiased. Algorithms decide what the ranking is. Now, obviously, it's not 100% unbiased, although the engineers would like to believe that, because humans program the algorithms. So there's always going to be some human error in there, and that's why they need to be improved, etc. Now, artificial, artificial intelligence will help a little bit with that, obviously, but again, that is also programmed again by humans. So there's always a level of bias in there. But at the same time, if a data source isn't public, then it would create a bias. So having Google, just as an example, Google ad, uh, Analytics. If I would use, as Google, uh, for example, if I uh, would be at Google, and I would use Google Analytics data within uh, the search engine rankings as a ranking factor, to or to compute the ranking factor, even if it's not a direct factor, but indirect factor, the problem is I now create a bias for or against, because it could work either way, for every site that doesn't have Google Analytics. So, so just kind of bringing all this back into like simple tools, tips, tricks type stuff. So the, 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 the thing about, we talked about links, okay? So links can help you rank. However, user engagement keeps you ranking. I think we all agree on that. So Gavin does a huge amount of work on the PR side to build the brands that he works with, his affiliate site brands, so the people identify with them, search them out, click on them, etc. Engagement rankings. Then there's this other thread. So, so there's links for pay up for page rank. You haven't got any rankings. You need some links because it's a it's a way of of helping Google identify that yeah something's going on here. You get into the traffic. 
the links stop working or stop working as much as they used to. All, it's all shades of gray. There's no hard and solid binary facts here. Then we have Philly saying, I don't do links for page rank. And he's saying, I do links for brand. Is that right? Is that roughly what you're saying? No. And so do you. You're saying that, Gavin. He's saying that. And what do you, are you say, so you're saying you want the traffic and... Uh, I'm saying... Well, it, it's so you're saying you only want a link for traffic? No, there's three faults. First one uh, we discussed earlier, but that is the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, mine stopped working, I think. So the first one was uh, um, the uh, discovery part, the content discovery. That remains important, by the way. The internal linking, being able, like the um, this is actually touching on the on-page SEO. You do need to have a good internal linking structure because otherwise your content can't be uh, discovered. Or you're sending the wrong conflicting signals to Google. What is your canonical URL? It's stuff like that. So there's a whole bunch of things on on-page we haven't even touched on where linking also plays a factor. Um, then we have uh, wh what... I agree with you on the branding part. Brandability is one of the other reasons where, why you might want to build links. And the third one is converting traffic. Yeah, so those are, now that's from an external linking building perspective. Those are the three factors why you build links. Not for page rank, uh, you know, not for any of that stuff. You do it purely so that Google can discover your content. You can show that you're a brand also to your users to build a trust level and then also to make sure that you make that conversion. Because without the conversion, what do you have? Why did you create a website if it wasn't for the conversion in the end? Or the brand? Yeah, one of the two. Like The brandability can still be the conversion. And there, the example of something like Coca-Cola or something like that would pop up in mind to me. I know you want to touch on on-page. So if, if you want to talk at all about on-page, we better get to it. Yes. Yeah. OK. okay. I, I just like to end the links conversation with a, a rhetorical question. I wonder how many truly natural links to gaming sites would really exist in the whole universe on a daily basis if it were literally just people saying, I had a great time playing at Maria Bingo late, uh, earlier today. It just would never, ever, and, and link to it. And hold on, let me type in HTTP. It's colon forward slash forward slash www.mariabingo.com. It just, I, there'd be like none. Of course. And Google must understand this as well. So that's where, just a final rhetorical thought on links before we talk about on page. So let's start with Gavin and let's talk a little bit about the PR. You know, from a PR perspective, again, it's more to drive acquisition than anything else and uh, recognition of the brand. Um, but again, on page is a funny thing because if you, it depends what kind of website you have again and what your goal is to do with that website. If we look at some of the community driven websites that we have, you know, we have people who spend a hell of a long time on there, right? Because they're actually, you know, posting content and contributing to the website. So in that respect, we have a group of, you know, hardcore on-site users who are doing our engagement metrics, wonders in that sense, right? But then you have the other half. I mean, if, you know, if the stuff that they're writing is not as good as you may hope, um, then you probably have the other half who are coming in from either a SERP or whatever, whatever else and potentially bouncing quite quickly, right? So it's also important for us as a tech company to, to really understand which is the uh, high quality content which we want to push forward and which is maybe the kind of content which is fine, everyone's got their opinion and have got a right to display their opinion, but we might not want to index that potentially, right? So again, it's, uh, yeah, it's how can we not manipulate those engagement rankings so forth, but how we can potentially push them a little bit more in our favor. So manipulate it, yeah. So you're, you're, it's, about, it's about quality content and architecting what you want people to do with it. So just on the quality content thing, uh, if you ever read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, you'll know a guy went insane because he tried to define quality. So let's try and define quality, shall we? And when I talk about quality, like stuff people want, I talk about quality evaluator guidelines. The document that Google use for training quality of website, website quality evaluators. And it's just like a Bible full of really good stuff that says this is what great content looks like. And the word that comes through again and again and again is satisfaction. So when I think about content, I think two big things really. One is Google is right. If it ranks ahead of me, it's because it's better than my stuff in the context of that keyword and a bunch of other contexts. 
So instead of going, no, Google's wrong, I'm just going to game it harder, I have just I gave up that game five years ago. And I just said, Google is right. How can I out-compete? How can I do better than the site that's ranking ahead of me or the site that's ranking number one? Because user engagement. So even if you've got a really thin, crappy little like bonus site, the fact is, it is engaging to the right person if it's the right set of bonuses for the right keyword. It's stuff people want. So quality, rater, quality evaluator guidelines, well worth the read, 142 pages, I think. And Google is right. Just start looking at who ranks ahead of you and ask yourself why and then do something about it. So regarding the uh, the guidelines for the search quality evalu uh, evaluated, actually the rating uh, quality uh, uh, quality rating uh, guidelines, it's a nice introduction kind of thing to search. If you're not familiar that much with Google uh, uh, on how they look at what URLs or what search results may be relevant and how they care about users, this is an interesting document to read. Other than that, I wouldn't use it for SEO. Uh, the key element to keep in mind is, it is what you're saying, it's about user experience marketing. It's really about managing user expectation, having a unique sales proposition. I'll share an article on this last part uh, later on on Twitter on the hashtag uh, that you see there, um, if you're interested. But the key thing here is, it's about the user. Google has said that from the beginning. If You can read the document, and again, it's an interesting read, but I wouldn't use it for SEO purposes necessarily. The primary principle that Google used uh, when they started saying, focus on the user and the rest will follow, this is coming down to that. Now, I wouldn't say necessarily the rest will follow. Uh, you still have to work hard uh, and you do need to make some effort there. But the focus on the user part is something that even other successful companies that uh, don't necessarily depend on search like Amazon have done you know, and they've been successful because of that not because of other things, because they've really focused on the user. Having a unique sales proposition is super important, especially for every page that's indexable. Every indexable page is potentially competing with other uh, pages of competitors or other sites that may not even be a competitor, but you may see or they are informational, different purposes, different intent. You know, uh, you're trying transactional intent but the site is informational, say in Wikipedia, that's not necessarily competition, but still it's there in the search results, so you have to compete. Uh, the, other th the other part that you have to think about here is also um, really providing a good user experience on the site itself. And it's not just about the user experience creating that, that's very important by the way, but Google also needs to be able to see that. That means technical on-page SEO is super important. That's the part you have full control over. You may not have full control over all the links that are being placed to your website, and let alone discover it at all, because Majestic and Ahrefs and all the other tools, they're doing a great job of trying to find all the links of the web, but I guarantee you one thing, Google has found more. Yeah? And they're using that, and you're behind, or the other ones are behind. So you don't know every single link on your website, uh, or to your website if you have a larger profile. Like a very small one, you probably do, but if you have a large profile, say a million backlinks, chances are you probably have more than a million, you just don't know about it. So we're talking about crawl budgeting, are we? And no, we're talking about a number of things. Crawl budget is one of them. Uh, I'm talking also about page speed and other things. You need to be having a great website, first of all, for the user, but also for the search engine. Because if you don't make the website crawlable, then Google can't pick up those URLs. If you're sending conflicting signals, and I'll give you one example, say that you have page A that's canonized to page B, well, uh, that is 301 redirecting to page C. So now you're canonizing to a redirect. That's a conflicting signal. Yeah? So Google now trusts your canonicals. Good question. With a single one, probably not a big problem. If this is 20% uh, of your website doing it like this, this is going to be a problem. Yeah. So, so, so I think most presumably, like let, I'm just curious, H hands up who have pages or sites with pages less than say 2,000 or so less pa 2,000 pages or less on their website. I'd like, <coughs> would it be how many of you would have small websites? In other words. 
So quite a few of you. And how many have enterprise scale websites? We're talking like 100,000 pages plus where canonicalization and crawl budgeting and all that stuff really matters. <laughs> right. So, so just getting back to a couple of really simple things for you to think about. And they are this idea that around user satisfaction. Because we can talk about techie stuff all day long, but I'm seeing a lot of people drifting away here. So getting back to really simple stuff. The idea of user satisfaction. And the idea that your page serves a purpose. If it's a listings page or whatever it is, it does something for somebody. And so when you think about rankings and you think about where am I ranking in relation to this, just as I said earlier, think A, Google is right, but also think about the keyword you're ranking on and think about the intent behind the keyword. Like, why are they typing the word in? What, what question do they want answered? Does my page answer and satisfy them? And then you get into the on-site stuff because if your site isn't snappy, there's another nine websites that they can go and click on that are going to be easier and quicker to see than yours. So this is why page speed is huge. So it's like this really simple, super simple fundamental stuff. And the, the annoying part of it is, 10 years ago, we could have talked about tools, tips, tricks that you could game your way to the top with, but it just isn't like that. That door has closed probably two, three years ago. So, so you're now into that really tough thing of, is my site any good? I would actually say it's more than uh, two, three years ago. It's been a while already. Uh, Google does, like, I agree with you that uh, for, from a, a user perspective, as I mentioned, unique sales proposition is the key here. User satisfaction, meeting, uh, managing user expectation. If you say in the search result, hey, uh, click here and buy green cars, and you click on it and you get to uh, an overview page, a product page with red lollipops, that's not managing user expectations. Users are going to bounce, that are going to generate negative user signals. This is something you need to manage well. If it's slightly off in color, like you can go obviously with slightly bigger nuances, but you need to manage user expectations. Yeah, the, this is one of the ways why door pages don't necessarily work that well, because people have to continue to click to actually to go where they want to go. And this is also the reason why Google has to, uh, talked for a very long time in the webmaster guidelines, don't create door web pages because they don't lead users to the satisfaction part. They don't lead users to what they actually want because now they have to go to an extra search result or the extra page. Like that's also why Google doesn't want search results in the search results because so, and people just go from one search result to the next search result before they actually get to the, where they want to be. So it's all about user satisfaction in this one. That I agree. Indeed, with. and I just want to build on that. So I did a big project last autumn with a mega affiliate and uh, they were getting their asses a bit kicked by another affiliate and they were moaning because they were saying like their website is shit compared to ours we've got all the data it's full of interesting stuff no it's not better collective but because uh, you guys rock of course whatever happens you like you know but, um, anyway so so anyway, the, the, there was a very, I came up with a concept which was helpful. And there's this idea of insiders and outsiders. So many of your sites probably have lots of fancy stuff going on like metrics and tips and whatever the hell it is, good stuff, which is great if you're an insider. In other words, you understand what's going on on your website. If you're an outsider, what the hell is this? I don't get it. You've, I'm only going to give you eight seconds. If I don't understand what's going on in eight seconds, I'm out of here. So when you think about, in, so the big in, epiphany for me with this big brand that I was working with was that there are insiders and outsiders and they were only really catering for the insiders. Traffic from Google is outsiders because they don't know what the site's looking like. That's why they've gone to a search engine. Uh, Not only that, they don't care. They don't care yeah. who your brand is. It's very simple. They don't care who your brand is. They don't know anything about you. They don't necessarily want to know anything about you. So stop having a pop-up saying, you want to, do you want to subscribe to the newsletter? No, I don't know you yet. <laughs> so, so taking this, so the upshot was and is, 
if you look at your website as an outsider or go and talk to your mom and say, mom, what do you think of this? And let her poke around the website for 15 seconds and then ask her, what's all this about? And if she doesn't really have a clue, that's a clue to you. And another thing, but go back to that bingo site that I mentioned, just a simple fail on the header, the navigation area, meant that they lost a ton of rankings because people clicked in, clicked out, and they couldn't make sense of the site in eight seconds or less. In fact, three seconds is your, is your number. So this is just super simple stuff. Well, uh, we're out of time, unfortunately. I had some questions for everyone, but I'm going to end with just one question um, for Gavin. Um, Gavin, ranking in Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland, um, is it much easier in 10 seconds or less? Is it much easier in local language, or are you not really getting much of an advantage and you should continue to just try to rank in English language? No, I mean, of course, the local language is, is much easier because the the quantity of content out there is much smaller. So, of course, its competitiveness is, is far, far easier. So when the Swedish market re-regulates and there's a lot of sites that disappear, is the Swedish market going to be an easier market to SEO for? Uh, it depends on which keywords because you're still... So, yeah, because, I mean, then the operator-led keywords, like if you're looking at odds and so forth, you're still going to be competing against the operators, but a lot of them are going to be gone. So, yes, technically, yes, it will be. Yeah. Even though I think... M&A is another question, right? Because what's going to happen with those websites? Someone else will probably snap him up, and uh, yeah, hopefully it's you and, and not the others because you'll we'll be competing with Orion. Smaller pool, right? <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, so anyway, we learned quite a bit there. We learned how much you could learn by getting a massage. Um, <laughs> learned quite a lot of us for free, by the way, <laughs> which were free. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause, please, for our panel. I'm going to pass the microphone to Mr. Scott Longley, who is going to run the last session and take you on. Is it not, are you not running the last session? Who's doing it? Oh, is it a break now? My mistake. I'm not passing the microphone to him yet, but he will be back in a minute after this break. So go enjoy your break, and I'll see you at uh, four something, probably.